I'm really excited to talk about uh, my PhD work, or some of the work that I've been doing the last few years. Um, so the title is fairly long, Designing Marketplaces in Civic Engagement Platforms. So I'll just get started for sort of seeing what that means. And sort of at a high level, I know we have a lot of a fairly diverse crowd and it looks like over 50 people. So I'm going to make it, try to make it mostly accessible in the sense that I'm not gonna say, there's gonna be a lot of math on the slides in some cases, I'm not gonna say any of it and try and try to translate most of it to English. So, okay. So my research focuses on the online platforms that, you know, especially in the last month or so, we now increasingly interact with and through uh, each other. So, and the application that's probably familiar to us quite a bit is two-sided marketplaces. So things like ride hailing, like Uber and Lyft, but also uh, places where we can find transportation or work or other connections such as LinkedIn or Upwork. And an application that might be less familiar, uh, I have also worked on what are called civic engagement platforms, which is how uh, we as groups of people can come together to make public decisions. So something like, uh, how does a city decide parts of its budget? Can you do that through a voting mechanism? And when these platforms are designed well, they really allow us to connect, earn, and transact with each other in ways and at a scale that we couldn't otherwise. And of course, at this point, we all know that there's a flip side to this in terms of wasting resources and like adversary behavior and like biases and inequity and all sorts of that, which is why it's really important, I believe, for academics um, outside of industry as well to contribute to um, the design and analysis of these sorts of systems. So what do I mean by design? What I mean is that the sort of the central planner of each of these platforms has to make a lot of decisions about how interactions are going to go. So uh, it might help people find each other through matching or recommendations. And it can be things like in ride hailing where they explicitly match you um, to another. So they match a rider with the driver or something like Airbnb or other platforms where you're, uh, you're just, uh, they help you search and um, search through a map or search through another function to find the right one for you. Or you can think about pricing as these, um, these central plat planners also have to price uh, specific interactions or also vet participants who have to determine who's allowed to be on the platform and who's not. Uh, on the civic engagement side, here I would think about voting, but in far more complicated spaces. So instead of just voting between two candidates, let's say you wanna vote for a really complicated policy space or a budget. So you wanna decide how to allocate several million projects across 20 projects. How do you even, how do you even elicit opinions from people becomes challenging. So what do you ask for what do you ask from individual people to give you? And then how do you aggregate that into a decision? Uh, so um, my work is uh, at around these issues and trying to make these decisions and make these design decisions in a principled manner. And so what sort of tools do we use in this field? Uh, it's a mix of theoretical tools. So there's a lot of uh, sort of complicated aspects of these systems and you can't experiment with every possible design. And so the first step in a lot of, uh, in studying a lot of these systems is you try to make simplifying assumptions and make a toy model for how these systems are operating and then uh, leverage all, all host of tools from across fields to uh, study these sorts of systems. And this is where I think for those of you who thought I was an electrical engineer or a computer engineer is, uh, that might be scratching your head at this point. So this is sort of the connection with that field is that uh, a lot of these theoretical ways to understand these systems actually are um, natural analogs or extensions from like the types of things I was doing in undergrad or what you might be doing in undergrad electrical engineering. So for those of you in EE, if you like squint later on the slides, you might see some Laplace transforms or some other stochastics going on. Uh, but then after you understand these systems theoretically, uh, there's a lot of complications that you, of course, ignored in the model. And so then we try to understand these empirically, either through running experiments or looking at historical data to analyze these sorts of things. And throughout this talk, I'll give um, sort of, uh, I'll dive into at least some of, the, some of the issues in my dissertation, and we'll try to uh, give, give examples of these, these ways of thinking. 
And really the goal at the end is using these tools, how do you connect platform design decisions that these platforms have to make to the human behavior that it induces in the operation of these platforms in order to have better, more efficient interactions. So the, so, okay, so um, given that very like 100 feet overview, let's start going down into the types of things that I did in this dissertation. So uh, in part one, uh, which is composed of just a single chapter, I'm gonna talk about uh, pricing in these online marketplaces. And in particular, how do you design payment mechanisms for uh, drivers and ride hailing platforms? Or more generally, how do you design payment mechanisms for workers on these uh, freelancing online platforms? And this is the part that I'm gonna go into in some level of detail and for uh, an extended period of this talk. Then in part two of the dissertation, I consider how do you design rating systems? Um, and this is, um, so in, in rating systems and a lot of these platforms, um, they're really information systems. So how do you um, find out the quality of a particular item or a particular experience on the platform? And how do you do that in a way that is useful to the goals of the platforms and things like vetting participants or identifying the best items? And then and finally, I'm going to talk about voting on civic engagement platforms, or rather voting in high dimension for high dimensional or really complicated policy spaces. Oops, let me close what made that sound. Okay, so uh, for parts two and three, I'm going to spend maybe um, five or 10 minutes at the end and really focus a big part of this uh, on part one, just as an example of the ways of the, um, the ways to do um, these sort of designs. Okay, so let's dive into part one. This is joint work with Habib Nazarzadeh, who uh, is a professor at USC Marshall, uh, but was also my intern, uh, intern advice, intern mentor at Uber a few summers ago. So there I was on the driver pricing team, actually working on a lot of these issues for the platform as a whole, where how do you pay drivers for individual trips? But then throughout the talk, I'm gonna be using some data that's gonna come from a public data set from Wright Austin. So the central challenge for paying um, workers on these platforms, such platforms, or particular paying drivers on ride hailing platforms is that demand is fluctuating substantially. And this is gonna be true throughout, like on the order of weeks. So this is um, sort of the top image you see on the top right is a daily demand or daily number of trips completed in Wright Austin over a couple month period. And you see a surge, which is one week during South by Southwest. Or if you look at the similar plot for what, what's probably happening on these platforms in the last month, you'll see quite a bit, uh, big dip compared to the standard usage. But not only do you see fluctuation on the order of weeks, you also see fluctuation within the day. And so the bottom plot on the right is the average number of trips completed per hour um, on Wright Austin. And so you see sort of in Austin bars close at 2 a.m. And so you might see a, a spike around then, but then you see like a dip and basically no one's writing around 3 or 4 a.m., but then the standard rush hours come back. And so the issue with this demand, and so in reaction to this sort of fluctuation, you need to have surge pricing in order to match demand with the real time supply at that given point. And so one way to think about that is you wanna allocate the rides to the riders with the highest valuations. And the other way to think about that is you wanna convince drivers to drive when and where there's high demand. And so, okay, so this is well understood in like fairly standard economics. So what's the um, point of the talk uh, in this part? And Kel, can I ask a quick clarifying question? Yeah. Um, just to make sure I understand, you're saying demand fluctuates substantially. There's temporal fluctuation. And then there's the fact that looking at the same day of week or even the same week of uh, month or year that uh, there's lots of variance. Yes. In the sample path you might see. You mean one of those, both of those? Uh, I mean both, uh, I mean both of those. So um, in, in the actual model, we're going to look, we're actually going to make a sort of a Markovian model that actually just looks at the second one. Um, but sort of the, the plot, yeah, so I am being a little shady in between those two types of variation in like the, the, the plot at the bottom. So the plot at the bottom is like at the mean hour, like 
the mean at 2 a.m. is like high, but the mean at 4 a.m. is low. But there, of course, is like substantial variation around that on a given day. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So what, what's the challenge here? So um, what I'm going to motivate the talk with is by spoiling half our empirical finding. Um, I'm not going to get a chance to explain how I generated this plot. I'm happy to go and then the private session for the committee. Um, but what I'm going to show is, is how does accepting a given trip request change a driver's earnings over the next 90 minutes? So what that means is the driver is driving around and they get a trip and they're going to, you know, that trip is going to last 15 or 20 minutes. How does that change what they earn on average over the next 90 minutes? So not just the earnings during the trip, but also afterward. And so I'm going to show you a plot where the y-axis is in dollars. It's going to be the increase or decrease in earnings because they accepted this trip. And the, um, the x-axis, the horizontal axis, is the surge factor. Which is, so think of surge as just some, uh, for now, just multiplier on the trip. So because of how busy it is. And so a surge of 2x means that on average trips are 2x more expensive than they, than they would have been in a regular period. And so one, what one would expect to see is an increasing plot here, where as surge increases, the trip is more valuable to the driver and they earn more over the next 90 minutes. What you see instead is that that um, logic is about half right. Um, so if you take, take long trips, which here I just define as longer than the median trip length of 11 and a half minutes, then you do in fact see an increase of earnings, um, driver earnings with surge. But for short trips, uh, which is just uh, shorter than the median in 11 and a half minutes, you don't see that. So even if, even if the actual trip is two or three times more valuable than a, a regular trip, the driver actually isn't making any more money compared to the counterfactual of not accepting that trip if, um, even, if, uh, even with that high of search. And so this gap is problematic. And that this, um, in one sense, motivates the driver to want to take those long trips. So whatever the driver can do to get long trips by, for example, rejecting short trips, um, they're going to do. Or even if drivers can't behave in a way to, for example, reject short trips, this is going to be increasing drivers' earnings variance. And so uh, if drivers sort of, what this indicates is the platform is essentially running a lottery where drivers lucky enough to get long trips are going to be earning a lot more money than drivers unlucky who might get short trips. So Nikhil, just a quick question. This is corrected for time of day effects like, you know, 2, 2 a.m. after the bar closes. You're not going to get too many trips potentially and a long trip is more valuable than a short one. Um, so I don't actually do that correction. What this plot is showing is I matched, I matched the driver with another driver in the same area at the same exact time. So the matching is doing the correction. Are you match and then one of them has surge and the other one doesn't? I mean, how, what's the... Oh, uh, no. So, so one of them gets the... Uh, so um, the way to read this plot is the long and short is the actual difference between the two drivers, but the surge, they both have the same surge factor. So the surge factor is not the causal um, thing here. The surge factor is, I think of it as a state of the world. Right, but, but that doesn't... Uh, what I'm getting at is what if the dominant portion of this is coming in the late night time and not at other times when there is surge? Uh, how do you know that that is not the case? Or take a daytime evening PM, like 5 PM surge or during rain or something. Uh, is there a qualitative difference between those times when there is still more rights to be had mm. versus something at two in the morning? Uh, no, so what I did was I just sort of all of those ways that the world can like sort of those differences between 5 a.m. and 2 p.m. I just sort of collapsed that into the surge factor as representing those differences. So I didn't look at those other potential differences. Okay, that's fine. Let's, let's continue. Okay, so uh, and drivers understand these sort of differences. So this is a quote from a driver in an anonymous forum that they really dislike getting short trips especially during surge, because uh, it sort of they understand that it increases their long-term earnings. And so the team I was on um, 
this summer, or sort of that summer uh, at Uber, was working on a fix to this problem, in which what the, what the change was, was changing the old way to do search, which used to be multiplicative. So the old way to do search, um, so multiplicative means that there's some base payout for the trip, so think, you know, this trip is worth $15 because of time and distance, with 2x search, this gets multiplied up to 30. The team was working on changing that to additive. So in, for if you have two trips, one $15 and one $20, you just add the same amount of like seven or $8 or $20 or whatever the additive amount is, independent of the base payout. And so this was a change that, you know, took a long time and took, um, you know, many PhD data scientists, but also communications people, PM, software engineers, and really trying to, uh, I mean, sort of solve this issue, but also solving other issues. And so uh, what I do in this part of the dissertation is I really try to understand this change and try to see sort of, does this change actually accomplish what the problem, um, sort of fixing what the problem was, what exactly, what precisely is the problem and what other platforms might you expect a similar change to be useful? And so what our main results here are, um, the first what we do is I theoretically try to understand driver incentives with the pricing. And uh, so I first show why the old system doesn't work. And then we develop a new pricing scheme that's actually approximated by the system Uber ended up doing. Um, and then we empirically validate our theoretical insights with uh, right Austin data. So now, so now that we have the problem, uh, sort of at least trying to understand the problem, what I'm going to do is fairly quickly try to go through the model and um, just display some of the results. Uh, I'm going to try to avoid saying any math, but I really hope that at least for the audience that's not used to this way of thinking, I illustrate uh, why it might be useful to simplify what's a very complicated system with um, and sort of simplify that down to just a few specific aspects. Um, I do see that there's some, someone just some, said something on chat. Um, let's see. Ah, so, okay, yeah, so Deepak asked, um, was this fix explicitly designed to solve the problem I highlighted? or was it designed to solve other problems? Great question. So both, the answer is both, is that there's many other reasons that you might wanna do something like additive. I'm happy to go through those later, but uh, one of the issues uh, was, so at least my view is that maybe the precise difference wasn't like sort of precisely the issue wasn't maybe fully understood, but there were a lot of similar ideas floating around for like what problems you wanna solve. You also had a raised hand from Nathan Kwan. I don't really know what a raised hand is, but. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so, the, so the raised hand is that you want to unmute. So like if someone wants to be unmuted um, in order to ask a question. Um, I he think said I my would, bad, so. Maybe yeah, so I think, I, would a... I think I would prefer someone just like ask their question using the Q&A so I can just read it and then answer it. Um, unless it's like a long, complicated question in which they can raise their hand and we can unmute them. So by Q&A, I presume you mean chat, right, Nikhil? I think there's, I actually uh, can't I, tell I, the I, difference. I, Zoom has both a chat I, and a Q&A. &A. As well, right. Yes, yeah, so I don't actually know the difference. I assume both come to me, so. Okay, got it. Yeah, okay. So let's go through a stylized model of a single driver's day. Um, precisely, I'm going to assume an infinite time horizon and continuous time. Um, but, you know, sort of more informally, you have a driver who's open and waiting for a trip request. And at some point, the platform is going to come up to them and say, here's a trip, it's going to take you about 30 minutes, and here's how much I'll pay you. And then the driver gets to make a decision for either, okay, so either I want to accept this trip or I don't want to accept this trip. And then let's say they accept this trip and they're gonna be busy for some amount of time. And then they're gonna be open again for a request. And then at some point the platform's gonna come up to them again, maybe this time the driver says no, and this sort of game goes on forever. Uh, okay, so that's like a very, very simplistic understanding of what's going on. 
Uh, one way that this, uh, this is problematic, sort of, okay, so there are many ways why that stylized model of how the world goes isn't great. But sort of one of the big reasons is uh, why I motivated this talk with is that the world isn't static. There's uh, dynamics going on with demand. So for in this model, what we just did was let's just assume that there's just two world states in which there's like, for example, let's say surge periods and not surge periods or busy periods and not surge periods or not busy periods. And sort of the driver now has to make different decisions for what they're going to do during surge and what they're going to do during not surge. So I'm, I'm, uh, again, I'm going to ignore saying any of the math and just try to sort of say everything informally. So what this means is that there's going that let's say that during surge periods it's a lot busier, so just trips come up more often or they're distributed differently. And so the driver has different strategies that they might take in order to maximize their earnings during surge or other surge periods. And the platform may also pay different amounts uh, depend for each trip in each period. And so one way to visualize that is, um, so, the, so the image at the top right is again, the sort of the demand throughout the day that I showed you earlier, where how demand is fluctuating uh, throughout a day. And so there's gonna be a very simplistic model where let's just say, so when the, this orange bar is, at, is bottom, that means it's not a surge period. And when it's at the top, that means it's surging. And the world is evolving randomly between surge and not surge periods. And then the, everything I said earlier with the driver having to make their decisions for when they're going to drive and what sort of trips they're going to accept um, is now the same. But now everything is happening in this dynamic world that's evolving. And so, for example, the driver in that sort of um, on, the, on the leftmost on the screen, the driver sort of gets a trip request when it's surging. And they're going to accept that request and they're going to be paid a certain amount of money. And that trip might take them even though surge ends, uh, to sort of that might that trip might last them long enough that surge ends. And then they're going to be open and waiting for a trip request in like sort of out of rush hour. And this sort of game continues. But now you have to worry about the state of the world. And sort of what's interesting here, uh, what, what makes the analysis complicated, but also what's driving a lot of the effect of what's going on, is that when there's demand dynamics, the driver has to worry about. Um, what's going to happen in the future. So when they're thinking, you know, the platform's offering me a 30 minute trip that's gonna you know, pay me this amount of money, they're not just thinking how much I'm gonna earn during this trip, they also have to think about, okay, but 30 minutes from now, it's no longer going to be surging and so that's really gonna affect my future earnings, so should I hold out, long for, should I hold out for a longer trip? Or maybe if um, sort of vice versa for a five minute trip is, you know, five minutes for five minutes is not very long, and this might be the last surge trip that I get and for the rest of the day. So maybe I should hold out longer for an, uh, a longer trip. Okay, so this is sort of how the world is evolving, the dynamic model. And so what does the driver care about here? Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the math, but essentially let's just say that the driver cares about their long-term earnings. So again, the driver doesn't just care about their earnings on a trip, but they also care about their earnings um, on average, even while they're waiting for a trip. And so what they're going to do is they're going to take, they're going to go for a policy, they're going to accept or reject trips in order to maximize their earnings. So Nikhil, just a quick question. Yes. To, to contextualize, uh, to, to understand what 90 minutes after uh, they took something, in, you know, the ride during surge, what is the typical duration of a surge or the average duration of surge? Um, yeah, so uh, the so one way to do that is like what's the like the decay factor for surge because like because it's continuous sort of duration is like oddly defined. So one way to think about that is if the current surge factor I have a plot in this somewhere in the appendix that I can show later, but essentially if the current surge factor is like three, then thirty minutes from now it's going to be about one and a half. So like sort of the half life of surge is about thirty minutes. Okay. Um, but that, that's sort of the, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, that's all I'll say for now. So it's, it's not actually very long is the answer. And so that's why I think sort of this time scale, the, the model that I had is like actually the right time, right time dynamics. So if a driver accepts like a 20 or 30 minute trip, that actually is going to take the driver out of surge.
so what's the what's the platform's goal here? The platform needs to figure out how to pay drivers um, such that what I'm going to call is incentive compatible. So is they want to be able to pay the drivers in a way such that drivers want to accept every trip. Because if a driver rejects a given trip, so let's say the drivers are rejecting 10 minute trips, then people who want 10 minute trips aren't going to get served by the platform, which is bad for reliability. Or another way to think about it is if a driver, let's say a driver performs a suboptimal decision for themselves and accepts 10 minute trips, then you just punished a driver for accepting a trip, which is what you wanted to do as a platform. So the goal, what I'm going to say here, is you want to design a payout function such that drivers want to accept every trip. And under a condition that um, you're revenue neutral in the sense that there's a business constraint for how much you can pay overall. So what you, what you can't do is you can't sort of, what you have to play with is if you pay more for certain types of trips, then you have to pay less for other types of trips in order to pay exactly what you're receiving in rider revenue. Um, okay. so. And this sort of thinking, what sort of for those unfamiliar with sort of this market or mechanism design style of thinking, the way the way it works is sort of we had this high level problem, which I said at the beginning. And then I just went through a few slides of sort of trying to condense that high level problem to a simplistic stylized model of this is exactly this is sort of the version of the world that I'm studying. That's because it's really complicated to study sort of the sort of the full complicated world that's sort of related to some of the questions that like Ramesh and Balaji asked me. And so what I just did was explain this like simplistic model of the world that I'm going to study. And then that allows me to do a lot of math in order to sort of translate that model into insights or trying to understand um, how various features of that world evolve. And so that involves a lot of math that I'm not gonna go into sort of there's a reason the dissertations, almost 300 pages, with most of it being appendices, is that there's just a lot of annoying math you have to do in order to do this sort of work. Okay, but let's skip that. So let's see um, what sort of, let's jump to why we do this sort of math and try to see what, what kind of things can we understand about these sorts of systems um, by creating a model. So the first result in the paper is let's say that we ignore demand dynamics. So we ignore the fact that certain times of the, uh, certain times of the day are busier than other times of the day. Then it turns out that the old naive pricing model works, that all you have to do is pay drivers proportionally to the length of the trip, and that gets exactly what you want to do. Drivers are incentivized to accept every trip. But then the second result is um, sort of highlighting exactly why the change occurred is that demand dynamics actually make it so you can no longer just pay drivers proportional to the length of the trip. Because drivers no longer care about what's going on just during their trip. They also care about what's going on after, after their trip. And so I just displayed a partial version of the theorem, sort of what's going on if you do proportional payment during surge, sort of as an analogous result for what's happening if you're doing proportional payments outside of surge. But then the last result of the paper is, okay, how do you fix the problem? So the old way to do stuff doesn't work. And so the last result is that actually um, the new mechanism to sort of pay drivers is actually approximately the right thing to do. Where what we do is we construct a, uh, a pricing scheme that's approximately, that's well approximated by additive surge that actually turns out to be incentive compatible. And sort of there's some asterisks based on what I just said for in terms of like when exactly you can do these sorts of things and when you can't. And I'm happy to go into that in the Q&A. &A. Okay, so, okay, so what we did was we started with a complicated problem. We constructed a really stylized model that allowed us to do math and come up with some insights for what sort of what sort of strategies could work and what strategies might not work, um, assuming our model is true. Unfortunately, our model really isn't true. There's a million complications that I ignored in order to uh, come up with these results. And so the next thing we can do is we can try to understand um, what sort of insights from the model extend to practice by looking at some data. So here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at about 500,000 completed trips um, from Wright Austin. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Wright Austin is a 
not-for-profit ride-hailing company that operates primarily in Austin, Texas. Um, and they sort of started when Uber and Lyft left the city. Uh, and they released a year's worth of data for some reason that's very rich. So they have rich information at the trip level, including driver IDs and trip start and end time and sort of all sorts of things um, that are useful in order to do the analysis that I'm going to do. Um, and so, so why are we doing this analysis? There's many ways that reality differs from the model. I just have two ways up here. For example, um, I completely ignored location in the model and I completely ignored the fact that, so, and um, sort of surge is also not binary. It's also not Markovian, which means that it's sort of not purely, sort of, it's not purely just dependent on state, but also dependent on time. So if it's 6 p.m., then you know something about what's gonna happen at 6.30 because it's rush hour or something along those lines. Okay, so I'm gonna ignore, um, just for time constraints, I'm not gonna go into um, in the public session how I actually measured the things that I measured. Um, so I'm not gonna go into how I did the matching in order to construct these plots. But this plot is again, just the, the plot I showed at the beginning that if you match dri drivers to another driver who was at the same time and location, and then you see this driver got a long trip and this driver didn't, then this is how um, sort of that driver's earnings over the counterfactual of not getting that trip. And so you see in the actual system that the platform was using, you see this difference where drivers really earn a lot more money in the future over the next 90 minutes if they accept long trips, but not if they accept short trips. But then in simulation, I can study what happens if instead the platform was paying according to a different pricing function. And so I had to construct counterfactual payment functions. And if you do that, you actually see that the gap completely goes away. That long and short trips equally increase in value uh, for the driver um, as surge increases. Okay, so that's it for part one. I'll just quickly summarize what we learned. Um, we theoretically try to understand driver incentives with this pricing scheme. And this analysis shows what, how and why the old system doesn't work. And then we develop a new pricing scheme that's well approximated by uh, the scheme that a lot of these platforms ended up doing. And then we empirically validate our theoretical insights. Um, in the paper, there's a lot more interesting things like what happens in like, in, in, other, in like other types of platforms where surge might, for example, be a lot more common or long lasting than it is on ride hailing platforms. And I'm happy to go into those. Are there any questions before I go into sort of other parts of the work or sort of other parts of the dissertation? Okay, so then I'll jump to sort of at a high level summarizing um, parts two and three. And so, sorry, let's see, the Q&A. Okay, no, that was, okay, never mind. Okay, so um, these two parts are really about learning and online platforms and sort of I'll just jump into exactly. Wait, Nikhil, there is a Q&A. from oh, David. Is? Yeah, yeah, there is. It's separate oh. from the chats. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So uh, David asked, I looked at surge bounded in time. How about in space? Uh, yeah, so in, in the theory, I completely ignore space. Uh, there's in the empirics, of course, there's all those complexities about space that come into play. And sort of what we find is that the insights extend. Um, there's a few reasons that I think space is like um, sort of qualitatively different than time. Um, most importantly, that you can't ignore people's preferences over space. And that some people, for example, prefer to drive in suburbs and some people prefer to die, drive in the inner city, for example. Okay. So uh, moving on to the next two parts. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna motivate the questions asked in these two parts and then at a very high level describe the approach. So in part two, in part two this is uh, primarily with Ramesh, uh, what we consider is how do we design rating systems on online platforms. And so most of us has probably interacted with these sorts of systems. Um, what I have up on the screen is a bunch of five stars, five star uh, systems where uh, you have an experience on these platforms and then you 
um, give a rating for how that experience was. And then the platform uses that rating in order to do things for the future. So it might kick off people who are low performing, or it might punish them in search results, or it might reward people who get high ratings um, by prominent sort of display on the website. Um, but the issue, of course, is that now there's a whole bunch of empirical work that demonstrates on all sorts of platforms that empirically shows that these rating systems don't work, that basically everyone is getting five stars at all times in all of these platforms. And so the issue with that is, um, and I'll formalize this in a little bit briefly, is that if everyone's getting five stars at all times, then there's, then there's no informational content in the system. So someone who um, provides really great service and some, someone who provides, or like an item that's sort of below average because maybe the item is broken, then they're, if they're gonna get the same ratings, then the platform has no visibility on quality on the platform. Okay, so that's the first motivation. And this is sort of the motivation of part two. The motivation of part three is uh, voting in complicated spaces. So uh, this might seem like a very different problem, but I'll connect them in a little bit, which is uh, typically when we think about voting, we think about very simple voting systems where you have two candidates and you decide one over the other. But in a lot, lot of real world settings where we want to make democratic decisions, we actually are in far more complicated settings. So for example, let's say you have a, an entire budget. So you have the budget of a city or the budget of a university department or even a federal government budget. Um, you might want to allocate millions or trillions of dollars across many different items. How do we do that allocation? What if you wanted to vote on that? Or um, maybe something related to like with the primary system in the US going on right now is let, let's say you had 15 or 20 candidates um, vying for a party primary. How do you run a voting system in which people can indicate their preferences as well? And so the reason I combine these two parts is what both of these parts are really about is what the central planner needs to do is it needs to design the information that it receives from users. So what I mean is that the platform is going to do some sort of design. It's going to ask some sort of question and it's going to get information from the users. So you either get votes from users or get ratings from users and it needs to use that to make decisions. And so there's an experimental part of the work, which is how does the platform design affect the response distribution of, that you receive from people? So for example, if you ask, um, how does this person rate on one to five stars? Are you actually getting different responses than you would have gotten if you asked the question, is this the best freelancer you've hired on our platform? And there's analogous things in voting. And so um, in one paper, for example, with Ramesh, we show that uh, we partnered with a large online platform and we show empirically that there is a large difference when you ask different questions. So if you ask a numeric five-star scale, you're gonna get very inflated responses. Basically 80% of people are gonna say, yeah, this, you know, are, give, are gonna get five stars. But if you ask more specific questions, then uh, you get a much nicer distribution of responses. And then the second part of the work is really a theoretical question, which is, okay, you're getting different response distributions, but the platform doesn't actually care about the response distribution. What the platform cares about is some decisions it's gonna make down the line. So it's gonna rank the participants or rank the items, for example, and use that ranking in search results. How does the response distribution connect to that thing that the platform actually cares about? And here is where the theory comes in, um, sort, of, uh, sort of at a high level, what we do is you can map the response distribution in order in sort of into the exponent of how quickly the error decays down to zero. Um, this is also called the large deviations rate for if you define the error in a nice way, then you can sort of do this mapping uh, emerges quite cleanly. And then we use this framework, sort of um, parts two and three uses this very high level framework in a variety of contexts. So in the rating system context, we sort of answer a few questions like, um, can we, after you run an A-B test, 
and get different distributions with different rating systems, how do you decide which design you should choose? Or maybe stepping back a little bit, sort of can you even identify what's a more, uh, sort of what's an ideal rating system you could ever design? If you could sort of control human behavior completely, are there um, sort of, are there contexts where you actually do want inflated ratings? Are there contexts where you do want inflated ratings? Or finally, in the voting setting, we sort of, we answer questions like, how do you uh, sort of, how do you, how should you design the ballot? Do you ask each person for just their favorite candidate? Or do you maybe ask people for their favorite three candidates? Or maybe do you ask them to rank the favorite three or favorite five? And then you sort of aggregate it in a certain way. And all of this comes from the same framework. And so I'll just summarize how that maps into the papers or the um, different parts of the dissertation. So in this first work, um, we sort of, uh, this is, I guess, I don't know what chapter it is, but it's in part two. This is with Ramesh, which we empirically observe that ratings are inflated. And then we show how you can solve that with uh, clever UI design. And then in, in this next work, we, um, this is more th the more theoretical part of the problem. What we consider is different platforms have different goals. So some platforms really care about the very top of the scales. Other platforms care about identifying the very bottom of the scale. How do those different goals map to the type of rating system the platform might want? Um, and so we sort of show how to do that. And then in part three, um, this is with uh, Ashish, Lodvik, and Sukhasak. Um, we sort of use the same framework to see how you would design ballots in sort of elections with many candidates. And what we show is that in fairly generally, what you want to do is you want to ask voters to identify the top few candidates as opposed to the, just the top one. And what's going on theoretically is that um, noise is asymmetric uh, between voters. And I know this is sort of potentially confusing at this high level. Um, I'm sort of running out of time, so I'm just going to very briefly summarize uh, a chapter that's uh, sort of not covered in the framework that I'm going to, that I went over before. You have a question before you move on to the next section. Oh, okay. Sorry. Do I, oh, yes. Ah, so, okay. So the question is, is how does this last part relate to, instead of asking people to give vote, like sort of give ordinal rankings. What happens if grades are elicited? So you ask people to give numeric rankings. Um, and like, can you design uh, UI techniques to sort of like calibrate people um, with like different numbers? I think that's like roughly um, what the question is. Um, that's a very good question. So uh, the sort of here, what we considered was either people giving like multiple choice answers. So something like grades or giving ordinal rankings or partial rankings. And um, in both of those, we were able to map that onto the same framework. We're essentially saying that what's common about both of these, like either numeric or ordinal rankings is ultimately they induce separation between um, two people. So if you get many grades from two people, about two people, or many votes about two candidates, you can try to separate those two candidates uh, on average. And then sort of, uh, I know that doesn't completely answer the question, um, but sort of the, uh, but yeah, so, so both of those frameworks can be handled. Um, on the quick question about Arrow, none of what I just discussed has any um, sort of idea with the strategy proof nature of these issues. So for those of you familiar with this field, there's a lot of um, work on in what question, in what settings can you ask, can you ask questions such that people truthfully report their votes or truthfully report their preferences? Um, I actually don't deal with that question in this work. Okay. Um, I am running out of time, so I am gonna actually um, just jump to uh, the conclusion. So um, what I hope to do in this work in sort of my dissertation was uh, combine theoretical and empirical methods uh, to show them in combination to shed light on how to build and design social technical systems. And I, you know, I hope to have a long research career going forward. And so there's a long list of interesting problems 
um, to look at. I'm happy to talk about these in the Q&A and the private session. Um, so for that, I'm going to jump to questions. I know that was sort of the end was a little quick. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, I'd suggest actually, if you could just take like one minute, it's worth it for you to say a few words about the last couple bullets on your last slide, uh, the, the long list of interesting poems. Okay. Especially, especially the first one. Yeah. So, uh, so this is actually something that I've been thinking about more recently, which is, so, um, and you know, I, I think for most of us, um, the COVID-19 lockdown has been on our mind or like has been our daily reality for quite a bit of time. And something that uh, is interesting in sort of what's going to happen moving forward is our public spaces are going to be capacity constrained. And so we can't all use the grocery store at the same time, or we can't all use the park, park like various parks or other public spaces at the same time, because you know we have to socially distance. And so one question there is, you know, you have the grocery store employees, or you have a local government running a park. How do they allocate different time slots? How do they say, you know, Nikhil, you're going to use this time slot. You're going to you're, you can use the park from nine to nine thirty. Ashish, you can use a 9.30 to 10, and Ramesh, you can use a 10 to 10.30. Like, how does that allocation happen in a fair way? These are actually exactly the type of socio-technical systems that um, sort of, these are similar types of socio-technical systems to what I um, studied in the rest of the dissertation. And uh, I'm looking forward to working on this problem, for example, hopefully in the coming months. And actually, so I'm gonna hold off questions until I just sort of, there's a lot of people I want to acknowledge and thank and just say a few words and then I'll do questions afterward. And I think we can maybe take a little bit past 11 uh, for the public session just because we started a little bit late. But I, I will go to the acknowledgements first. Um, so first, I just really want to thank uh, sort of, none of this would have been possible with my, my advisors, Ashish and Ramesh. They really are like the best possible advisors that I could have, could have imagined for me um, sort of five years ago. And sort of, you know, I really want to thank y'all for your patience and sort of the help y'all gave me throughout. And sort of, I'll say a few specific words for each of you. So, uh, Ashish, you sort of, you're one of the few people I know where even after five years, you can say something and it's like surprising that that's what you said or that's what you did. Um, so whether this is like, you know, like, sort of like a certain research problem that you just decided to start taking up, like you want to build a new search engine that's for um, sort of not profit results only, or you want to take up flying. That's really, I think, a model for me on how to take risks and just like do new things. And really I'm hoping to like, you know, also be someone who can just surprise people like that. Um, Ramesh, you've sort of, I think, really modeled how you can sort of work on like a whole bunch of different interesting research problems that at the same time like serve the academic community in a variety of ways and like really take care of teaching and like not forget like all of these like non-research parts of our careers and uh i think that's been been really good and useful for me to see um yeah so thank you both of you um, of course, thank you to the rest of my committee members. Um, I haven't been able to interact with you all as much as I would have hoped throughout my dissertations or throughout my PhD. But this is, I think, part of why I wanted each of you uh, on, on my committee is like, you know, I hope to get a small piece of y'all's feedback and I'm looking forward to interacting with y'all more in the future. And so thank you for spending um, sort of y'all morning, y your Friday morning uh, with me. Um, I've had a bunch of sort of research mentors th uh, throughout my time uh, here at Stanford. Sort of two, two people I want to highlight are Hamid and Vijay. So Hamid was uh, my co-author of the driver search paper that I mentioned at the beginning. And sort of I met him a couple years ago. And since then, he's really been a great friend and just like sort of like a third research advisor in many ways, just like helping me throughout the process. Um, Vijay, was a postdoc uh, here uh, at Stanford my first couple years. And I, I feel like he really took me under his wing uh, my first year, uh, sort of really he like, really helped me sort of onboard into what graduate research is and sort of how do you think through problems and how do you do problems. And sort of my first paper 
that I wasn't able to spend too much time on in this defense was actually sort of a big part was due to him and sort of a big part of like the, the habits I learned was due to him. And he's been a great friend and mentor since then as well. Um, of course, there's a, like a great community. Sort of, I, I feel also lucky part, being part of a great community within Stanford. There's the Society and Algorithms Lab and more generally a bunch of MSE faculty. Um, many of y'all have been really generous with your time, that, like, especially this past year while I was on the job market, but also um, before then and just like giving me advice on career aspects or feedback on papers or for example, managing our, like, our compute cluster that I've like, used or abused for many of my papers. Um, and then finally, on the research side, I wanna, you know, I've, I've also been really lucky to have a really large, diverse group of authors, uh, co-authors on my papers from all sorts of fields, from you know, electrical engineering and computer science and MSNE to political science or linguistics. And I've really sort of learned from each of you uh, quite a bit throughout my time. And then, you know, I think what the last year has also shown, or the last few months have also shown us is like none of these communities and none of sort of this stuff can work without essential staff and sort of like support of many other sort of support staff throughout our lives. And here I just want to highlight a few people from support staff from MSME and EE and uh, employees of my local coffee shops. And then um, sort of a few more is uh, I, I've, I've been very sort of, this is where I'm not gonna say names because I sort of don't wanna leave any names and I'll just display a bunch of pictures. So these, I've had, I've met a lot of great people over the past five years, sort of, I was lucky enough that my PhD has taken me to five continents and um, sort of, I've traveled, so I've traveled with many of you over the past five years. This is, and you know, I think, this is certainly the most fun part of a PhD is sort of just like meeting a lot of people who do many things and sort of having late board game nights or just talking or especially first two years talking about consistently dropping out and doing a startup instead of finishing my PhD. So I really, really valued and appreciated sort of all that time and like potlucks and other things that we've done. Um, this is where my pictures are missing because I don't take pictures and I couldn't find them on Facebook and so on. But um, I'm also lucky that I've had many friends that are really lifelong friends sort of that I've sort of met in elementary school early on for second, third grade, and that I still keep in touch with on like a monthly basis and like sort of visit each other and hang out uh, quite a bit. And so uh, yeah, so and I think many of you are on this chat. So yeah, I really appreciate sort of the continuing friendship as we've grown um, through elementary school all the way through undergrad and kept in touch since then. And then finally, of course, um, sort of really grateful uh, to sort of the like never ending support of my family, sort of uh, my parents, um, mom and dad and my sister Nikita, and as well as grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins, sort of uh, mostly in India, sort of, uh, and yeah, I really appreciate sort of your support. Again, I think many of you are on this call, and so thank you. Okay, um, on that note, I'm sort of maybe take like one or two questions before ending the public session. So it's customary for the advisors to say a few words. So maybe Ramesh and I can uh, say a couple yeah, of words. Yeah, I would really appreciate it. So uh, Nikhil has always carved out his own path. By the way, I didn't, I had no idea about that startup conversation. So <laughs> uh, that's news to me. <laughs> but when Nikhil started working with me or us, he wanted to combine his background in engineering with his interest in solving uh, thorny socioeconomic problem. And incredibly, that's what he said five years ago, but incredibly, that's exactly the right description for his thesis. And that's also the right description for his future work. And generally, sort of, when someone shows such consistency, it shows a lack of imagination. <laughs> but in his particular case, I think given how varied the socioeconomic problems are from domain to domain, say from Uber to civic decision making to rating platforms, this has required enormous versatility and creativity. So I, it's, uh, 
in a way his thesis is uh, somehow the finest emb embodiment of stanford's founding principles right we say that we should be both scientists and also defense makers so it's been uh, a great pleasure working with you and i'm looking forward to your future career unfolding i hope ramesh has something more humorous to say <laughs> thank you um yeah i was actually i, I was going to comment that uh just reflecting on working with nikhil you know, agree with everything that Ashish said. One thing that's interesting is that um, leading up to Nick Hill heading on the academic job market, there got to be this running joke in our meetings where I keep asking him what he wants to be when he grows up. And he didn't really have a very uh, pithy answer to that. Uh, you know, as, as Ashish said, it, the description of Nick Hill is pretty big. It's that he wants to take a wide range of engineering tools and solve a wide range of very hard socioeconomic problems with social impact. And I kept trying to get him to narrow to have some sort of narrative to describe himself. And, you know, every week, the weeks would roll by and we weren't getting there. Um, and historically, I've always been kind of someone who's trying to press students to have some like more succinct description of themselves heading in the job market. So for me, it's really been actually a, a great learning experience because one of the things I observed about Nikhil is that he really came into his own this year in finding a way to not only kind of stake out that large claim, but defend it really well um, in the way that he articulated it to other people. And I actually think the job market was a big part of him getting better at doing that. So at least for me, uh, it's been great kind of to observe that, you know, I think sometimes when students are dreaming that big, it's actually good to let them fly and then just wait for the scaffold to get built in the air. Um, I think there's a lot of value in that. So good job, Nikhil. It's been a pleasure working with you, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you do as well in the future. Thank you both. Are there any other sort of questions or any other things before we end up the session? So, so again, the way for those of you who don't know how defense works is this was the public session. It lasted about an hour, and then you know we'll hopefully take a five minute break, and then they'll grow me for an hour or so on. Um, sort of in private on sort of some of the more technical aspects of the work. Okay, well, um, thank you no, everyone. I think now it's the, the, the time where we all clap, but <laughs> I don't know how we can do this now in Zoom, so yeah. <laughs> You have to unmute yourselves. I just unmuted everybody, so if oh. they all want to clap, we can. <laughs> they can. <laughs> That's very uh, good. So yeah, I mean, I, I, you you have a fantastic dissertation, so I guess you do deserve this big clap from everyone. So, <laughs> are we doing? Are we all clap at the same time? <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> Perfect. Cool. Um, okay, great. Thanks so everyone. If there are no for questions, me. we'll move to your other Zoom link, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So um, for those on my committee, I sent you a different Zoom link. Um, we can move to that in a little bit. Um, I guess there's no other questions from the audience. Thanks everyone for showing up. Bye.